thank you everybody and again thank you to Mitocon to give us the opportunity to present uh, our preliminary results on primary mitochondrial myopathy. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, we analyzed 118 patients with a PMN. As you know, uh, yesterday we had a very long discussion uh, on this topic. Uh, neuromuscular signs and primary uh, myopathic signs and symptoms are extremely common in the mitochondrial diseases. This is an overview of what we have in 13, 30 patients in Italy. And uh, wherever you, you look, you can see that most of the um, most of the most common signs we have in mitochondrial diseases uh, involve the neuromuscular uh, system. And uh, as we have learned yesterday from the round table with the industry, uh, we now have a lot of clinical trials that are either coming or already running in different phases. And so it's extremely important to overcome the dilemmas of the heterogeneity of mitochondrial disease to have clear in mind what is a mitochondrial myopathy because most of the time when we have muscular signs in the patient, these signs are not the only ones. They may be uh, present in a multi-system way. And even if we define the primary mitochondrial myopathy, we need to know how to quantify and monitor over time the skeletal muscle involvement in a mitochondrial disease patient. So uh, the first uh, thing that was organized to better clarify the agenda was this international workshop that we organized in Italy a few years ago with uh, a lot of uh, uh, mitochondrial experts coming from all over the world. So we decided to define for the first time how we should consider a patient affected by primary mitochondrial myopathies. And this is the definition we, we have generated uh, four years ago. So PMMR, as we now uh, know, genetically defined disorders leading to defects in the oxidative phosphorylation machinery affecting predominantly this is important, predominantly, but not exclusively, the skeletal muscle. Uh, the clinical presentation uh, is uh, mainly affecting the, the muscle, of course, and here you can see the most common symptoms or signs that the patient may develop. Uh, I'm not going through the entire list. You can read it, but... Uh, this is mainly the most common manifestation of a PMM. And from a phenotypic point of view, these patients may be affected by pure progressive external thumboplegia. They may uh, be affected by a pure mitochondrial myopathy without ptosis and thumboplegia, or they may have a combination of both phenotypes. So the PO is for sure the most common phenotype of PMM, and we observe a progressive external thumboplegia in the PO in a, at least two thirds of all PMM patients. Uh, everybody knows how is defined uh, from a clinical perspective the PO, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. Uh, uh, it's clear that uh, the Ptosis uh, uh, usually uh, is associated with the ophthalmoparesis. Diplopia can be present, but it's not so common, like, uh, for instance, myasthenia gravis. Uh, sometimes the PO, as uh, I was saying at the beginning, uh, can be associated with uh, uh, limb girdle uh, muscle involvement, uh, distal weakness is not so uh, common, it's rare, but it can be present. And uh, it can also involve swallowing, so dysphagia and also respiratory failure may be part of the PMM uh, manifestation. And from a genetic point of view, 
PMM uh, may be, as we know, autosomal dominant, recessive, sporadic, or maternal inherited. So we, we do not have an easy genotype-phenotype correlation in this uh, PMM. From a diagnostic point of view, with, uh, okay, beside the clinical approach, we may use specific biomarkers. Uh, the most traditional ones we have learned also from ANU yesterday that are not uh, either specific or sensitive, uh, lactate and CK. We now uh, have this uh, FGF and GDF15 uh, biomarkers in blood that are quite sensitive. We still perform in selected patients the muscle biopsy to confirm the mitochondrial involvement uh, as the cause of the disease of our patient. Then we need to go through the uh, either mtDNA or nuclear DNA analysis to find the mutation. But when we have a patient with the PMM, we face daily uh, several challenges. First of all, as we have learned yesterday, do we really know how this patient uh, evolve over time? Do we know how to monitor them? Which are the most reliable outcome measures? Uh, are we ready to monitor uh, the changes of a PMM uh, over time? If yes, how do we do this? And how frequently we need to see these patients to detect a, a clinical relevant change? And can we measure changes uh, of the PMM status under a specific drug? Uh, so now that we have uh, clinical trials running, how should we monitor these patients and which are the most sensitive outcome measures? And actually, so far, nobody really knows. So what we did was to analyze prospectively uh, the clinical data, outcome measures, quality of life questionnaires, circulating biomarkers in uh, 118 adult uh, Italian patients with uh, PMN, with uh, either a mitochondrial or a nuclear uh, DNA mutation affecting the oxidative phosphorylation. So this is briefly the methodology we have used. We, uh, once we got funded by Teleton and Nitocon, we <coughs> uh, had an online discussion uh, on the outcome measures to, to try to identify which one from the uh, workshop paper were the most reliable or the ones that we decided to use. We have then organized a training session live uh, in Milan, uh, and we did the training in order to reduce the variability. Uh, we have presented uh, at the end an instruction manual that was submitted uh, with the CRF to all uh, centers uh, to harmonize data collection. So from the uh, consensus paper, we decided to use the following outcome measures. Uh, the functional test that we have selected was the six minute, the time up and go, and, uh, and the five times sit to stand test. And for this phagia, we used the time water swallow test and the test of masticating and swallowing solids. We used the NMDAS, uh, as uh, performance outcome measures, we use the spirometry. We have also used two patient reported questionnaires, the fatigue severity scale, which uh, define the fatigue and the severity of fatigue. And then we use the West Haven Yale multidimensional pain inventory scale, which is a uh, uh, good reliable uh, scale for pain. And then we, we collected in the morning the following biomarkers. So the six minutes walk test, we, we were all already trained for the six minute walk test because of other studies and trials. And we compared the data we obtained with the reference values obtained uh, from normal controls in this paper. 
uh, as far as the timed up and go test, this is the, uh, the, the performance the patient has to do. And uh, basically stand up, uh, moving uh, for three meters and coming back, sitting and do the same exercise for uh, three times. And we compare this uh, with the reference values obtained from the literature. And the same was true for the five times six to stand test. It was compared to uh, the reference values in normal controls obtained uh, from, the, from this study. Uh, we did the same for the swallowing, and uh, we have at least two nice paper with the reference values that we used for both uh, the water and the solid swallowing test. Uh, this is the Italian Validate Fatigue Severity Scale. So we, we didn't have any ba language barrier here because uh, this is validated in Italian. So here is the scale for fatigue. And uh, the same is true for the West Haven, which is also validated in Italian. And we paid special attention to the part uh, one sub items which evaluate the pain severity. And we compared our data uh, with the, the paper from a very historical paper uh, that was analyzing a cohort of more than 100 patients with the chronic pain syndrome. So here are our results. We uh, identified again 118 patients that are now followed prospectively. Uh, we have 58% uh, female, uh, the mean age is around 50 years, uh, with the disease onset around 30 years, and the uh, mean duration of disease of 21.5 uh, years. As far as the genotype we have in our cohort, you can see that we have 39% uh, of patients with a point mutation, 35% uh, single deletion and 26% uh, of our cohort arbor and nuclear gene mutation. And here you can see the distribution of all our uh, mutation in our cohort. So most of the patients have either mitochondrial DNA single deletion or mitochondrial tRNA point mutation, and uh, we have 20 patients with the 3243 and 12 with the 8344. We still have in our cohort, this is one of the bias we have, unfortunately, 12 patients with multiple deletion and uh, exome sequencing uh, is still running, and so we don't know exactly the nuclear gene involved in these 12 multiple deletion patients. Uh, here are the results. As you can see, uh, all our patients uh, with the six minutes, uh, <clears throat> they walk less than the reference value. And even if we split male and female, we can see that our median values in male is around 420 meters, which is almost 200, more than 200 meters below the reference value and the female median value is around 366, which is below the reference value. And both uh, findings are uh, significantly uh, impaired. Here you can see the distribution of the six minute walk test in our cohort. And as you can see, we also compared our mean results with the only two studies at that time we found in puppets regarding PMM patients and six minutes, the rotor study that more or less presented the same mean value at six minutes, and the Empower study, the Elamipretide phase two study, neurology. And in this patient, in the Empower, the patient were walking uh, a little bit more compared to the Italian and the motor study. Even though we, we should say that in the uh, Empower study, there were more females compared to 
uh, the other two studies. <clears throat> as far as the tree tag, again, we found uh, significant uh, impairments in our Italian cohorts. The median value here is 28.8 compared to eight seconds from the normal controlled studies. And the same was true for the five times six to stand uh, outcome measure, which was uh, uh, 26 seconds compared to 11.4, uh, the reference value of the six times six to stand test. The Thomas, uh, the Thomas results, the, the, you know, the swallowing of the solid uh, was not significant, the difference uh, in male compared to controls. It was a little difference uh, in female. And as far as the water swallowing test, uh, we didn't observe any significant difference between our PMM and controls. Uh, the fatigue severity scale in our Italian cohort was extremely, uh, in, you know, impaired. You know, the average value was around 40. And normally, we to, if we fill up the form, the questionnaire, we stay be below two. And as far as the uh, part one of the West Yemen, um, we also observed a high score for pain severity in PMM cases, compare, even comparing this data with the with 120 chronic pain cohort study published uh, almost 35 years ago. Uh, we didn't observe uh, any changes in a CK or lactate distribution, even though uh, if we look carefully <clears throat> at the data, we can see that lactate was higher than 1.8 in 54% of our PMM patients and above two in 30% of our patients. And the same was true for the CK values, which were minimally increased in 30% of our patients. This is not significant. Uh, can you hear me, sorry? Yes, Miguel Angelo. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I got a strange message. Okay. Um, but um, now I got lost. Uh, okay, meaning that it, this is absolutely true what Anu said yesterday. They are not good, reliable biomarkers, but in few cases, we may have uh, lactic acidosis and a little bit of increment of CK. So in a good clinical frame, they are still useful. And those biomarks didn't correlate with any other outcome measures we have evaluated. FGF and GDF15 uh, were both uh, increased significantly in our PMM cohort compared to the control values. Uh, again, confirming what Anu was saying yesterday, we have only three patients in our cohort with a mutation in the respiratory gen subunits. And uh, as already mentioned yesterday, these kind of patients usually do not have uh, high levels of FGS21 and GDF15. What about the differences among the genotypes? Um, Basically, uh, we have evaluated the three most common cohort here uh, in this uh, slide and uh, uh, heteroplus mid levels in muscles <clears throat> did not correlate with uh, any functional test. When we focus our attention on the 3243 mutation, 20 patients, we observed that lactate was increased in 40% of them and lactate levels correlate with the FGF and GDF, also with PEV1 and heteroplasmy, but they uh, didn't correlate with the uh, outcome measures, uh, performing actual measures. When we look at the distribution of the functional outcome measures, uh, we found that patient harboring the single deletion uh, which usually have an earlier age at onset, they performed better 
then uh, mitochondrial DNA point mutation and nuclear mutation. In the six minutes, they perform better in the three tag, and the same was true in the six, uh, five times six to stand test. However, uh, patients with a single deletion, they perform worse uh, in terms of uh, swallowing uh, the Thomas and also in Feb 1. There was no difference between uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA uh, point mutation patients in uh, any scales we have uh, administered it. We also did the correlation analysis among the functional scales and we found that there is an inverse correlation between the fatigue severity scale and the six peanut and the direct correlation uh, between again the fatigue severity scale and the, the TAG but also the NMDAS and the swallowing test. Um, so uh, FSS correlate inversely with the six minute walk test and directly with the other scales. And we think that this reveal uh, that there is an agreement between the perspective uh, of the, 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 the perception of fatigue uh, of the patient and the objective outcome measures we have used. So basically, uh, there was this strong agreement uh, between the functional scales and the uh, uh, fatigue severity scale, but also with the West Haven questionnaire for the pain. These two scales at the end, that we believe, are good and reliable uh, measures of pain and fatigue, and also exercise intolerance in this uh, PMM cohort. Uh, here you can see there is a uh, correlation between uh, fatigue severity scale and the NMDAS, and there is also correlation between uh, sw swallowing and the NMDAS and the tree tag and the NMDAS. And again, I guess this is the last one, uh, we found the correlation between uh, uh, you know, NM does score and disease duration. The longer was the disease duration, the more important was the impairment uh, we observed uh, the NM does. If we focus our attention to the mitochondrial translation machinery uh, patients, here we observe that we have, uh, even though we don't have a lot of patients here, but we have a good uh, basically correlation between the both FGF, uh, which is this one, and the GDF, and uh, the heteroplus me. <clears throat> and we also have uh, a good correlation between uh, uh, lactate and the uh, NMDAS score. Of course, we do have a lot of limitation and weakness in our study because we have collected a patient at different stage of disease with different duration of disease. And therefore, the timing of biomarker analysis and also the clinical and outcome measures we have performed was variable from patient to patient. We, it was impossible to have homogeneous uh, PMM population in terms of uh, age at onset and the duration of disease. We do not have details on the uh, size uh, of the del single deletion. We do not have for all our patients uh, information about the uh, breakpoint or the involved genes. And uh, lastly, <clears throat> the functional outcome measures uh, we have chosen are highly dependent uh, uh, upon the skill of the investigator. And so we, we know that we may have uh, inter uh, intra-individual variants. Uh, that's why we have organized a live meeting uh, with the various, I guess, uh, good training of all the operators involved. But this is something that we must face when we deal with rare disease. We need to collect uh, patients from different centers and there is no way, no money to uh, homogenize 
what about the future perspectives? We are now going to deeply evaluate all our collected data according to the phenotype. The data you have observed so far are not split in the three main PMM phenotypes. So we're not sure, for instance, if the patients with the pure mitochondrial biopathy are performing worse compared to the PO. We are going to see and look at this data now, and we are now collecting the data prospectively. Uh, we are ready to have most of the data at 12 months, and we are, uh, you know, the plan is to keep collecting uh, prospectively the data up to 24 months minimum in this 118 uh, patients. So let me close my presentation with the uh, special knowledge to the entire Italian community that you can see in this cartoon. We are all working together. There are uh, a lot of people involved in this uh, Italian network. Uh, I'm just the, the speaker of the network and all the job we make it will be possible to develop without uh, the collaboration of all these people of the slides. So thank you very much. And I'm also very grateful to Mitocon and to the other European international societies who support the Italian network, all our friends that we, we have in Europe, in the US and uh, abroad that are talking to us. And finally, let me thank to, uh, deeply to Dr. Di Mauro, Billy. Uh, I mean, Massimo already showed this picture yesterday. So you already see me when I was young with Billy having fun in the forest in Calabria, Enrico. This is yeah. <laughs> in the Sila. Uh, Billy gave me really everything. I think, as Massimo said yesterday, he's extremely generous, simpatico, friendly. I learned how to make risotto in New York. I never had the chance to spend time and learning how to make a real risotto, Billy told me. And of course, uh, thanks to Billy, I met Anna. Uh, Anna is my wife. Here she was visiting us at the PNS building. And then we got married a few years after. We are still very much in love with each other. And uh, here is Billy and Sheila visiting us a few years ago in Pisa with my two children. So thank you, Billy, for everything you made for me and for the Italian community as well. Thank you very much.